Mosul, Iraq is hard to get to. It's not a place many people go, especially since 2014 when ISIS, or Daesh as the Iraqis call them, invaded the country and took Mosul as part of their caliphate. But what few seem to know is that Daesh was pushed out of Mosul and Iraq as a whole in 2017. And through the pandemic and beyond, the Iraqis have been rebuilding the city that they love. Mosul is bisected by the Tigris River and has a civilization that goes back at least four millennia to the heart of the Assyrian Empire. This is a breadth and depth of culture that is hard to grasp. It's especially hard when our modern understanding is so clouded by war and the nightly newscast. We are invited to follow a U.S.-based organization called Hardwired Global as they cultivate pluralism and freedom of consciousness in a region plagued by fear, suspicion, and as we soon found out, an intense joy and desire to heal. Day one starts out with a trip to a formerly ISIS-controlled school in Nimrod for a community event around the Hardwired program. An extremely conservative city just south of Mosul, the Hardwired team, led by Tina Ramirez, was concerned about the cameras at the first sight. They thought we might need to wait in the car while they felt out the situation. They were wrong. Finally, the students came out to perform Fruitopia. Part of the hardwired training curriculum, it's a play about the importance of tolerance, pluralism, and human freedom told through the lens of different fruits. Though it seems quaint, it's a framework to have hard conversations and a perfect example of the way hardwired's grassroots education and training is impacting communities. Can someone tell us what they learn about the program? <laughs> In Fruitopia, the different fruits were actually fighting against each other and hating each other. However, at the end, they learned that they have to be one community working together. And this is so much like what happened in Iraq. But now we are back uniting together, helping each other, because this is the only way for Iraq to flourish. What is uh, one thing that they could say to Americans back in the United States? I just wish that all these wars would end because we have seen lots of people dying. It's terrifying and it makes every child afraid and I don't want to be afraid anymore. We arrived at Lalesh, the holiest Yazidi place and the tomb of the founder of Yazidism, Sheikh Adi a Kurdish-speaking monotheistic people whose belief emerged in the 12th century. Yazidis were heavily persecuted by Daesh in 2014. Over 5,000 Yazidis were killed during the genocide at Mount Sinjar. We didn't have any chance, just fled. ISIS, they did uh, horrible things in Sinjar. They took women and young women and they raped them they took the boys. They threatened them, if you don't be with us, we will kill you. It was deep, deep suffering. When you lose farm or something material, you know, things, it's not losing. But when you lose a people, human, this is the hardest. Al-Yazidi idafa ila shakhsiyatihi huwa muhib lilhayat. Yazidis, they love life, love to live. Tastati an ta'akhudhani mithal. I'm one of them, the example. This is our land. It deserves to stay and build it. He said, I have the uh, feeling of love for everyone, but hard Hardwired gave me the tools to convey this love. 
Brian told us that it was this suffering that inspired him to join Hardwired, to fight for pluralism and diversity. The only way forward is to turn their joint suffering into power. Our next stop was the Court of Churches, a historic site of four distinct Christian churches in the devastated old city in West Mosul. They were destroyed by coalition airstrikes because ISIS had converted them into their home base of operations during the occupation. Yeah, ISIS uh, occupied this place and used use it as a headquarter for them. So this is the church where it hit by airstrike. During the liberation? Yes. You've been rebuilding so much since last time I was here, too. Use the handrails, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you hear the call for prayer. Yeah. The sound of bells are missing now, and we want to hear both sounds here in Mosul. So the call to prayers as well as the church bells. Yeah, it, for me it's a sad moment to only hear the, the call for prayer, even if I am Muslim. You see? Well, but you can see all the destruction from up here too. It's... And just step on the concrete blocks only. It's not fully demined. <gasps> it's not fully demined. So how do you guys come in every? We day? have hard hats. <laughs> well, <laughs> so yeah. we sometimes take some risks. When you look at it, what does this represent? The reconstruction and. I mean, I'm encouraged by what Anas is doing and how the Muslims here are leading the efforts to rebuild, and I think that the community that has fled, seeing that gives them hope. Even as this construction takes place and it will eventually be rebuilt and the people will come and there will be this great celebration as we were talking about. The people have been able to continue. Their faith, their, their lives have continued even outside of the buildings because that wasn't something that ISIS could destroy. Daesh could, couldn't destroy who they are as a people. And I, as a people, I mean, they've survived for 2,000 years in Iraq and in many other places uh, with that faith that's, that goes beyond a building. I was here two weeks after the genocide started and the communities were forced to flee from Sinjar and from Mosul and the Nineveh Plains. And meeting those families then and seeing the refugees that had fled or the displaced people that had fled and hearing their stories and now being here seven years later and all the work that we've done in between, it, there is hope. I think hope is being restored here in so many ways and this is just one example of it.